So what would lambda be here? One, and what would lambda be here? Negative one. So let's just, let's just verify that these are good. Let's let x be two, y be three, and lambda be one. So if x is two and lambda is one, is this one true? If, if lambda is one and y is three, th that one's true, right? And then we already know that if we plug two and three, let's see, two and three here, two here is four, three here is nine, right? Four, nine, 13, so it works, right? So this satisfies all three, this satisfies all three, we won't, we won't check it, but they work, right? Are we done? We're not done. We're not done because all of this that we got was all based on the assumption that x was not zero, right? So what if x is zero? So now I would close this off, like I would say, okay, this, all of that continues over here, and then I ended. Now, let's take a look at what happens when x is zero. Do you see what I'm saying? Like when you're doing these problems, if you stopped there, I have to take off something. Like you in some way have to show me you took into consideration x being zero. Suppose x is zero. Well, if x is zero, what? Well, the first equation cannot be Equation one's not true. Equation one becomes um, two is equal to zero, which isn't true, right? Which means you're done, right? You're done, basically. You could also argue the same thing for y. Suppose y was zero, then equation two would mean that three equals zero. Right? The reason why I'm looking at y equals zero also is because in the beginning I was said use equation one to solve for lambda, right? But you could have very well have used equation two and solve for lambda and divided both sides by y. In either event, the, the dangerous thing is that you may say, oh, if x is zero, then I have two answers for, for y, right? If x is zero, I have two answers for y. Or if y is zero, I have two answers for x. Yes, equation three, you can do that, but you can't hold these two. These two won't work when you do that. It's gotta be all three at the same time. So I think at this point, we've exhausted everything. So now what we do is we plug in. So evaluate. So we want f of two, three. We want f of negative two, negative three. And these are going into the original function, so it's looking like 8 plus 18, 26, and the other one should be negative 26. So if you take this plane, and you're only allowed to plug in those points that live on that circle up into the plane, the biggest value you'll get is 26, the smallest you get is negative 26. And here's the visual of it. There's your domain. Here's your domain on the ground. Plug those points in. Creates this weird sort of ellipsy thing. Let's take the plane out of here. We just found the highest and lowest points on that. I guess in theory I could just stop right now and just let you go and do these on your own in homework, but I really do think that it's worth seeing enough of these because like I said, the algebra is going to start to get messier. So let's just do some more. All right. New functions, got some E in there and constraint function over there. So let's do this. Equation one. Partial of f with respect to x must equal lambda partial of g with respect to y. So what is partial of f with respect to x? e to the xy times y. So I'm going to write it this way. y e to the xy must equal lambda and then partial of g with respect to x, which is, why did I write y? 
sorry, that's a mistake. I meant to put x there. Lambda times partial of g with respect to x, which is 3x squared. OK? All right, that's our first equation. Second equation, partial of f with respect to y equals lambda partial of g with respect to y. So what's our partial of f with respect to y? x e to the x y equals lambda times 3 y squared. And then our last equation is the constraint itself, x cubed plus y cubed equals 16. All right, we've got to solve this system of nonlinear equations. Again, there's different ways to go about this. So you want to isolate lambda again? And then you want to take that and plug it in there? Is that your idea? What do you all think of that? You all willing to go down that road? OK, let's go for it. All right, suppose x is not 0, right? Then equation 1 would be you're going to divide both sides by 3x squared, right? So it would be y e to the xy over 3x squared equals lambda. All right. And then I guess you want to push that into equation 2. So for equation 2, it becomes x e to the xy equals lambda, which is y e to the xy over 3x squared times 3y squared. Everyone good with that? Just replacing, going into equation two and replacing that lambda with what we just solved for. And now there's some stuff we can do to start cleaning this thing up a little bit. Um, I'm going to cancel the e to the xy on both sides. And I'm canceling them because I'm dividing through by e to the xy. I divide this side by e to the xy, divide this side by e to the xy. And I told you not to do that unless you can promise me it's not zero, right? But e raised to anything is never zero. So that's why I'm allowed to divide this out and not have to like say, suppose e to the xy is not zero, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to do that algebraically. So now I'm left with um, x equals, I have 3y squared over 3x squared over here, right? So I'm going to um, reduce that out. There's just y squared over x squared. Uh, what am I missing? Oh, where's my y? Oh, y cubed, yes. This y, sorry. I forgot that y. I was like, wait a minute. Something ain't right here. So there we go. Yeah, I've got the threes gone. It's got my y cubed over that. And then multiply both sides by x squared. Again, I don't have to worry because I'm saying x isn't 0. So I get this at the end, x cubed equals y cubed. And that's helpful because I have a relationship between x and y again, right? In fact, if I look at my constraint equation right now, it has x cubed and y cubed in it, right? So I can just directly go in here now, go to equation 3. And let's just replace, I don't know, let's replace y cubed with x cubed. So we get x cubed plus x cubed equals 16 which means 2x cubed equals 16, which means x is 2, right? Divide by 2, cube root. You don't do plus or minus on odd roots, so we get one answer. x is 2. So if x is 2, what's y? Also 2. Yeah, also 2. You can just go right back to that right there, right? So if those have to, so this implies that y is 2. And shit, while we're here, let's just get lambda. What's lambda? Ooh, lambda's going to be nasty. What would lambda be? If x is 2 and y is 2, here's our equation for lambda, right? So what would that be? I'll just do it right here. 2e to the 4 over 12. That's replacing x, x and y with 2 here. So we get, this is the first time we've seen our lambda be something weird. e to the 4th over 6. But lambda doesn't really play a role in our plugging into a function. It's just showing that we solved for all three unknowns. 
all right. So we'll have to consider that point. Now, we need to take a look at uh, x not being zero. We need to now look at what happens if x is zero. All right? What if x is zero? Suppose x is zero. And let's start over. What would equation one tell us if x was zero? This would be zero equals e to the zeros one. So y would be zero. Do you all agree with that? And so if x is zero, y would have to be zero from equation one. And then what? Equation three is gonna fall apart. Equation three then becomes zero equals 16, which isn't true. So we can't have both x, we can't have x be zero. Right? Or else we have a problem. Now remember, we solved for, we solved for lambda here by dividing in the, for the first thing we went after. We could have solved for lambda here by dividing by y, right? Y, 3y squared and saying y can't be zero. Let's just real quick run through mentally what would happen if y was zero. If y was zero, then equation, this equation would right here become zero equals, well, hold on, solve that one, right? So if we let y be zero here, we force x to also be zero, so we wind up same boat, same boat. yeah. Okay, this is good. So we only have one place, so we now need to evaluate and when we evaluate, we're doing f of, I forgot, 2, 2, 2, 2. So we plug that in and we get e to the fourth power. Hmm. e to the fourth power is what? What is it? It's an extreme. Which extreme? Is it the max or min? You don't have anything to compare it to, do you? You can pick a point though, right? Any other point that you can think of that lives in your domain, right? Has to live in your domain. You plug into the function and you see if it's bigger than that or smaller than that. So can we think of a number that satisfies this equation, another point? So right now I don't know. Uh, I don't know if this is a max or min. Do you all understand you can't just pick an arbitrary point? Like I can't pick the point zero, zero. Because that's not in our domain. It has to be something that satisfies that. So how about the cube root of 16? For x and y is zero. Okay, so something like this. Cube root of 16, zero. Would satisfy that equation, wouldn't it? Now let's plug that into our function. So this would become e to the, huh? Well, the cube root of 16 doesn't matter really, right? Because the y is 0. So this is e to the 0, which is 1. Got it? That's, that's this point plugged in here. With the y being 0, that gives me 0 up there. So I get 1. So which of those is bigger? This one. So that means that this has to be a max. And that means we have no minimum. We have no minimum. And the reason we don't have a minimum is because our constraint equation is not a closed curve. If we go back to the picture of this, this was, this was the picture we were looking at. And the, the constraint, x cubed plus y cubed equals 16, is this curve. And it goes on forever. So when we plug it into our surface, any point on that, on that curve there into our surface, we're getting this, it's like asymptotically approaching zero. It's never getting there, but it's, that's what it's doing. So here's the, here's the picture of everything plugged in. So we look at it kind of from the side. 
you can see we found our max. That's e to the fourth power. But as we move on the curve, we go out this way. It's just headed to, towards zero. So we don't have, you don't have a minimum, right? An asymptote, you never reach zero. So you can't say you have a minimum of zero. All right, did that make sense? Shit, I just erased something I wanted to show you. Darn it. Okay, I just want to set up those equations real quick again. It was y e to the x y equals lambda <laughs> times 3x squared. That was our first equation. Then it was x e to the x y equals lambda 3y squared. And then we had our constraint, right? And so the approach that was used was let's go after lambda, right? Okay, I just want to show you a different approach. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say suppose x is not 0 and that y is not 0. Okay, suppose they're both not 0. All right, that's my, I'm, I'm setting that up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by x. And I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by y. Now, why did I do that? Look at the left side of this equation. What is the left side? x, y, e to the x, y. And what is this one? x, y, e to the x, y, right? They're identical now. And so now, since this is equal to this, these are equal. So then at that point, I can go straight to lambda times 3x cubed equals lambda times 3y cubed, right? Follow that? Now, I know you may be tempted at this point to just divide through by lambda, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to kill the 3. I'm going to move everything to one side. All right, agree with that? Pull a lambda. And that's pretty much it at this point. So this means either lambda is 0, right, or x equals y. And if x equals y, then you could go back into the third one and get your 2 and 2 again. So I'm just showing you there's a different path to get to the same thing that did not require us solving for lambda. Instead, recognizing that these were almost the same and then manipulating them to be the same and then working it out. Then you would have to say, what if x is 0? What if y is 0? But we already know that would lead us to the same problems. And what if lambda is 0? We didn't talk about that. What if lambda is 0? If lambda is 0, then this first equation, if lambda is 0, then what does that mean? That means that the y would have to be 0, right? And here, if lambda is 0, that means x would have to be 0. So both x and y would have to be 0, so you'd be back in a contradiction on the third equation. So. All right. Y'all see what I'm saying about this is there's a lot of kind of logic and algebra in here. You have to kind of run through all the different scenarios. Just see if the next one's. Yeah, why don't you set up the first three equations? I'm going to go get a drink. See if you can set up.
Okay, I just unmuted my microphone, but let me let y'all continue working on it. The way I'm doing it up here is not necessarily the way it has to be done. It just, you could have done quotient rule and stuff like that, or power rule, I don't know how you did it, whatever. Are y'all ready to talk or no? Being serious, or yeah? Uh, yeah. Well, I first I was first seeing the engine room, and I was oh, really? No way, that's wrong. So then the driver that that's what I got. So you're okay with that? Yes, I am okay with that. Okay. Has everyone had a chance to look at this? Yeah. Um. Have you noticed that on on both of these, I have not said like suppose x isn't zero. Do you understand why I have not stated that? Why? Because zero is not in the domain of the original function. Okay, so when we look at the original function and the constraint, x being zero, y being zero is never even going to be considered to begin with. Right? So because of that, I can multiply both sides by x cubed here without having to state explicitly suppose x isn't zero. That's why I continue to just work and work. This is the point at which I'm going to start looking at some scenarios here. I, I think since these are both equal to 2 lambda, I can set them equal to one another, right? Okay. So what we have here is that x must equal y, right? And if x is equal to y, then I can go to equation 3 
and that will give me that 1 over x squared plus 1 over x squared is equal to 1, yeah, 1. So that's 2 over x squared equals 1, and then I can mess with this, and I get two solutions, plus or minus uh, root 2. And if x has to be y, then I can have root 2, root 2, or I could have negative root 2, negative root 2. Are we missing anything? I think because x and y can't be zero, it really saves us a lot of trouble here, you know? Because we can't even consider, like, what if lambda was zero? Like, if lambda was zero, then both x and y are zero, and then, you know, we can't do it. So I think we're good here. So we plug these into the original function, and we should get our max and min. Okay, I think I just, I have that worked out already. Let's see, I think I've worked it out. Yeah, so I've already, I've already worked it out. In the notes, I have this all worked out. But there it is. F of um, root 2, root 2 gives you root 2. And then F of negative root 2, negative root 2 gives you negative root 2. That one wasn't so bad, I don't think. If you could get the derivatives and stuff. All right. So just when things are starting to become somewhat OK, we extend Lagrange now. So like I said, the beauty of Lagrange is that we're not, con we're not restricted to just a function of two variables. Now you can get a function of three variables and have it subject to a constraint equation of three variables. And in this case, when you set, you still do the same thing. Gradients have to be parallel and the constraint has to be satisfied. The difference now is that when you set the gradients equal to one another, you have three components to those vectors, right? Gradient of f is three components. Gradient of g is three components. So you have to set all these components equal. And now you have, just from the gradient part, three equations, right? And then you have to have the constraint satisfied, which gives us fourth. But we also have four variables, x, y, z, and then lambda. So more equations, more unknowns, nonlinear. So that's life, right? Let's do part A first. We'll start with part A. We have this. This is a function of three variables. Even though we don't have a y in here, it's still a function of three variables. And are, are, do we all understand that this function of three variables cannot be visualized, like it's not a surface anymore. It's something else, right? A, a, way, a, way that I could, a way that I might be able to do this is something we've used in the past, which is temperature, right? So what if this tells you the temperature at every point in the room, okay? So like, you give me an x, y, z, and this will give you some temperature at every point, right? This says, okay, now you can't be at every point in the room. You can only be on this, this object, whatever this is. And this right here should be some sort of surface. This is a quadratic surface, so this might be like an ellipsoid or something. So it's saying when you're, this gives you the temperature at any point in the room, but if you're just on the surface of this three-dimensional yeah, three surface, moving along that surface, where's your maximum temperature and minimum temperature? That's the best I can do, sorry. All right, so equation one. What's equation one here? Partial of this with respect to x equals lambda times partial of this left side with respect to x, 2x, yeah? Okay, equation two. Partial of this with respect to y, which is zero, equals lambda times partial of this with respect to y, 20y. Third equation, 
partial of this with respect to z, negative 4, times lambda, partial of this with respect to z, 2z. And then finally, our fourth equation is the constraint equation. Do you see the power of this? I mean, if you had a function of five variables, right? With a constraint equation on those five variables, then you could find the maximum min as long as you could set the gradients, you know, well, within a scalar multiple of one another, right? So you'd have, in that case, six unknowns, six equations. And then it would be nice to bring a computer into play. The computer would probably help us solve these equations pretty, pretty easily. But we're going to do it the old-fashioned way. All right, so here we go. We've got to find x, y, z, and lambda. Where do you want to begin? Equation 2 already has something equal to 0, right? Yeah. So we can use the 0 factor property right there and just, yes. that tells us either lambda 0 or y 0. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with that because that's, that's for sure. Okay, so let's start in that. Um, equation 2 tells us that 0 must be equal to lambda times 20y, which implies that either lambda is 0 or y is 0. All right, so that's that's where we'll begin. And let's go ahead and take one of those scenarios. So suppose now that y is 0. I'm going to start with y being 0 and not lambda being 0. So if y is 0, do we gain any other information? y has nothing to do with this, right? This is what we're using. y is not in here. If y is 0 here, we still have an equation with two unknowns, right? All right, well, suppose y is 0. So all I know by this is that equation 2 is a go, right? Okay, we've got to get equation 1, equation 3, and equation 4 to be satisfied now. So you want to mess with, uh, you want to mess with equation 1 maybe? Or, I don't know, it's up to you. You want to go to equation one? Okay, so what can we do with equation one? Let me do this. Four equals lambda times x. Let's just do that. And I think over here we could do negative two equals lambda times z. Just dividing through by two on those. You want to solve equation one for x, or sorry, for lambda, and then plug it into equation three? Okay, let's do that. So we're supposing that y is zero. And now within this thought, I want to suppose that x is not 0, all right? So y is 0, but x isn't. I've indented it because it's still within this thought. So x isn't 0, so that means equation 1 tells us that lambda is 4 over x, right? And now we go into equation 3. I'm just going to continue this over here. So equation th uh, 3 would give us what? It's this one right here, right? That would give us that negative 2 equals lambda, which was 4 over x times z. And I can solve this. Like I can get a relationship between x and z now. Right? So multiply both sides by x, which I don't have to worry because I'm saying x is zero, is not zero. So solving this for x, I believe we get negative 2z. Multiply both sides by x, divide both sides by negative 2. And this should, this should now let me work with equation 4. Because I, I have a relationship between x and z. I know what y is. And so equation 4 is going to be, let's see, x squared. Let's replace x with negative 2z. So negative 2z squared uh, plus 10 times y squared. What's y? 0. 
and then plus z, I'm leaving z as z, z squared equals 5. Uh, you know, I messed that up. Yeah. The way I wrote that is wrong. Squared is on the outside. Okay, so I think we get 5z squared equals 5. Yeah. And that gives us z is plus or minus 1. Yeah. All right, we made some progress there. So here's where we are right now. We've got, um, oh, let's get the x's. What would x be? Well, I'm going to do these one at a time. Okay, so let, let me write it this way. I know that when y is 0, I know when z is 1, right? When z is 1, what's x? Negative 2, right? I also know that when y is 0 and z is negative 1, now x is positive 2. Now, I don't need this, but I'm writing it again. Remember, for each one of these, there's negative 2, 0, 1, and then there's a lambda that goes with this also. And what would our lambda be in this case? In this case, lambda is 4 over x. So that would be negative 2 would be our lambda, right? That's our lambda. And then this one would be 2, 0, negative 1, and then positive 2 would be our lambda. Okay, where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? We supposed y was 0. That took care of equation 2. And we supposed that x wasn't 0, right? So what if x was 0? So I need, I need to kind of start over again, all right? So if you're, you're looking at kind of our train of thought, we've looked at this, right, here. And then we looked at this. But we now need to look at this with this also being tr like 0 and see if we get anything. I think we're going to run into a problem, but let's just see. We have to work it through. All right, suppose that y is 0 and x is 0. Would we get something for z in equation 4? If, if x and y were 0, would we get an answer for z? Yes, but look, if x is 0, what is our first equation? 4, 0, right? Which isn't true then equation 1 would give us 4 equals 0, which isn't good. So that can't happen. We can't have y be 0 and at the same time have x be 0. All right, anything else that we haven't considered? What if lambda is 0, right? Because remember, this equation 2 could only be true if these two things were true. We have to look at both of these. We have to. But then also, that's all we have to look at. Because anything else that happens has to have these two things happen also. So lambda 0. Let's look at that one. Suppose lambda 0. Does this kind of give you a headache? I, I don't know. It kind of gives me a headache. I, I feel it's tedious. What if lambda 0? Equation 1 is dead, right? We get the same thing, 4 is 0, so that can't happen. So we have it. We, we've, looked at, we've looked at two possibilities that have to be true for equation uh, 2 to hold. And in those, we've exhausted every possible scenario. And so there appears to be um, two things to look at. Now we need to look at them. It was f of 2, 0, remind me, negative 1 or 1? Negative 1? And then f of negative 2, 0, 1. So we'll, one of these should be a max, one should be a min. So what do we got? 8, 12. When we plug in 2, 0, negative 1. Oh, no, not 2. Uh, 16 plus 4, 20, right? 20 here. And then when we plug in the other one, we should get negative 20. There we go.
How we do? Oh, wait, aren't we due for a break here? Yes. Here I am, like taking breaks, going and getting drinks, and y'all are all sitting in here. I already took my break. I'm good. I can keep going. Do y'all want to do this one, or you want to take a break and come back and do it? What do you want to do? Take a break. Yes. Take a break. Okay. 3:42. We'll come back at 3:55.
Okay, let's revisit that problem that we started class with, with the uh, ellipsoid and the finding the maximum volume of a box in there. So this was, this was the problem, and we saw what the setup was going to be like. We knew that we were going to have a domain that was going to be some ellipse in two-dimensional space. It was going to be a mess, right? But now, we're trying to find the volume of this thing. Our volume function is a function of three variables, x, y, and z. And it's simply 8 times x, y, z. We had agreed on that, right? But we said we need to get it to two variables. But now with Lagrange, we don't have to. We can leave this as a function of three variables. The thing is, do we have a constraint? So the idea here is that, remember, to get to this point, we have some x, some y, and some z to get there. But does that x, y, z have any restrictions? Can it just be arbitrarily anywhere? Where does that point, x, y, z, have to live? on the ellipsoid, right? Yes. Which means it's constrained to that equation. So our setup here is that this is, our, this is like our F, right? And that equation gives us our G. It's the left side of that. 9x squared plus 36y squared plus 4z squared, right? And then equals 36 will give us the equals K. Does that make sense? So this is, this is going to be done easily. Well, we'll see what the, what the gradients look like. But we should be able to do this without having to worry about all that weird domain stuff and moving around the edge. This, this should work out. Let's see. So let's set up our, what, how many?